believing he could use a vegetable to create the world's first threefold standardized unit for length, volume, and mass, Warner J. Spotsenheimer knew that he had found it in one perfect potato. As he dreamed about his incredible find, his mind drifted to the inevitable fame he would receive from the entire world, culminating in his recognition of being the smartest guy ever. However, tragedy struck when, in a moment of confusion, Spotsenheimer's wife believed him to be delirious from hunger, whereupon she took the perfect potato and turned it to the perfect batch of french fries, ending his dreams with a bowl of crispy golden goodness. Through the centuries, many different types of units have been used to measure things. For example, you may have read in the Bible about the cubit. Well, the cubit was the distance from a man's elbow to the tip of his middle finger. But there were different types of cubits that were used. There was the standard cubit, which was roughly around 18 inches, but then there was also the royal cubit, which could have been as much as 20 to 21 inches. So you can see how there may have been some confusion at times about how long something was. Or we may have used grains of sand, right, to, to mark the passage of time in an hourglass. So it's important to have consistency when we have these units of measure. In science, we want to have consistency so that one scientist can measure in the same way that another scientist can. In 1960, a group of scientists got together and they put together a system of measures that would give that consistency across the board. We call it the International System of Units. Since they did this in Paris, it was called the Système International, and that's why we have SI, not IS, written on the board. They established seven base units. These are units that are defined as a system of measurement that's based on an object or an event in the physical world. And we'll talk about each one of these and how they do exactly that. The base unit is the means by which we get all other units. So we can have base units, but we can also have what are known as derived units. We'll get to that in just a second. First, let's go through these base units and describe each one. First of all, the base unit for time is the second. We abbreviate it as a lowercase s. One second is defined as the time that it takes for 9,192,631,770 cycles of radiation to occur in a cesium-133 atom. Got it? Nah, I'm just kidding. You don't have to remember that, but just know that this is how we keep track of an exact second. Crazy, huh? But it works. Next, we have the unit of length, which is the meter. We use a lowercase m to abbreviate meter. Way back when they first established the meter, they established it as one ten millionth the distance from the North Pole to the equator while traveling through Paris. That's a bit clunky, right? So then they went to this standard platinum iridium bar that was kept in Paris in a special vault. But again, that can be a bit cumbersome, right? Every time you want to go establish your standard, you have to go to Paris. So what they did was this. They established it using something that we find in nature, naturally occurring. They established that the meter was the distance that light travels in 1,299,792,458 of a second. That's one meter. Now comparing it to some of the other measures we use, like the foot, the yard, one meter is slightly larger than a yard. It's a little over 39 inches. So our third category, mass, is measured in kilograms. Kilogram is the base unit of mass. Kilogram is abbreviated as a lowercase kg, like so. Now as far as the standard goes for the kilogram, for years they've had this hunk of platinum and iridium that they kept in a special atmosphere inside a vault. They actually call it Big K. Now they still have Big K, but Again, those things can change over time. Solids can change. They can become oxidized or what have you. So because of that, they wanted to use something that would be a little more consistent and again, something that we find occurring naturally. Just a few years ago, the kilogram was redefined. 
using something we call Planck's constant. Now, I'll tell you, you're not going to understand Planck's constant yet. We're going to talk about that in a later chapter. But just know they're able to get a standard for the kilogram just as they are the standard for the meter and the standard for the second by things that occur naturally. And so therefore, we get a little more consistency. Now, I don't expect for you to remember all the ways that they found these base units. I just want you to remember the base units, okay? Good. You may have heard of Celsius degrees or Fahrenheit degrees, but the actual base unit for temperature is what we call Kelvin. Now, temperature is actually a measure of the kinetic energy of the particles within a substance, how fast those particles are moving. So the more kinetic energy, the greater the temperature. Kelvin is a truer measure of that kinetic energy, and so therefore we use it as our base unit. Now, if you wonder how they standardize a Kelvin unit, again, it's sort of like these others. It's based on something that's naturally occurring. It's based on the fixed value of Boltzmann's constant. Like before, I don't expect you to understand Boltzmann's constant yet. I just figured you might want to know that these things are all done with a great deal of precision and accuracy. So we're going to talk a little bit more about temperature in just a moment. Kelvin and Celsius and Fahrenheit. The amount of substance is described in moles. Now the abbreviation for mole is M-O-L. I didn't do it. I I'm not responsible for this. Probably the same guy that abbreviated June and July on the calendar. One mole is defined as 6.022140076 times 10 to the 23rd power of really anything. A mole of eggs would be 6.022140076 times 10 to the 23rd eggs. A mole of pennies would be 6.022140076 times 10 to the 23rd pennies. Now you may be wondering, what in the world and why? Those are good questions. I'll tell you this way. This is a big number because a lot of the things we do in chemistry involve extremely tiny things. So small that it takes a great deal of them to be of any consequence. And I'll explain a little bit more about the mole, how we got this number, and what it's used for in chapter 10. But for now, just understand that this is the base unit for an amount of substance, and it's a very large number. For electric current, the base unit is the ampere. It's a capital A when it's abbreviated. The ampere is named for a French physicist known as André-Marie Ampere, who lived a few hundred years ago. It was named for him, though, because he's often known as the father of electrodynamics. The ampere is a measure of the amount of electric charge that's in motion per unit time otherwise known as electric current. Now that charge that passes through a current comes from electrons, charged particles that are passing through that current with great speed. So one ampere is described as 6.241 times 10 to the 18th electrons that are passing through in a second at a given point. The last one we'll talk about is the base unit of luminous intensity. Luminous, we think, light, correct? And that's the candela. The candela is abbreviated as a lowercase cd, and a candela was often described as the amount of light that would come from one candle. But obviously, candles can be different in one part of the world to another, so again, we needed something that was more consistent. So the candela is the luminous intensity in a given direction that's at 540 times 10 to the 12th hertz of frequency and has a radiant intensity in that direction of 1 683rd watt per steradian. This has to do with the frequency of light that's the standard. And as far as this part goes, if you think about the space, the sphere around that light source, then this is going to be defined in a very particular area of that sphere. Does that make sense? Anyway, this is the base unit for luminous intensity. And it has the same amount, as you can see, of precision and accuracy as the rest do. To give us very defined base units that gives us very defined consistency. It's great having consistent base units. For example, this is one meter. One meter long. But what if I need to measure something that's shorter than a meter? If something is smaller than a meter, 
how do I measure it with this? This wouldn't be very handy. Well, the good thing is that the metric system is based on a system of tens, units of ten. So I can take this and divide it into tens and tens of tens and so on. We have different prefixes that we use to describe how many of a base unit we might have. So this represents our base unit. Let's say we have a meter. That would be one meter. So how many meters would be a decameter? Well, that would be 10 meters. So the prefix deca is used to describe when you have 10 of something. By the way, DA is how we abbreviate deca. Hecto, with an abbreviation of lowercase h, tells us that we have 100 base units of something, 100 meters, 100 grams, and so forth. Kilo, or lowercase k, is a thousand base units. A kilometer or kilometer is a thousand meters. A kilogram is a thousand grams. Mega or a uppercase M, a capital M, is one million base units. And then giga or a uppercase G is a billion base units. We can go in the opposite direction as well. If we want a tenth of a meter, we can say that's a decimeter. That's a lowercase d, and it represents one-tenth, or 0.1, of a base unit. Centimeter. From the end to the one is a centimeter. And a centimeter is one one-hundredth, or 0 0.01, of a base unit. So anything centi is placed in front of means that you have one one-hundredth of that base unit. A centigram would be one one-hundredth of a gram. Milli represents one one-thousandth or point zero zero one of a base unit. A millimeter or the approximate thickness of a dime is one one-thousandth of a meter. Micro is our next division and it's designated by a lowercase mu. That's a Greek letter. It looks like a backwards cursive Y if that helps. Anyway, micro designates when we have one millionth of something, or 0 .000001 of something. Nano, which is designated by a lowercase n, is one billionth of something, one billionth of a base unit. So 0 .000000001 of a base unit. You get it? Now, we can go even further than that. Watch this. So if giga means that we have one billion of something, a terabyte, for example, would be one trillion bytes of information. So tera, T-E-R-A, a capital T, designates when we have one trillion of a base unit. Peta is when we have one quadrillion of a base unit. So a petabyte would be one quadrillion bytes of information. Wow. We can go the other way too. We said that nano describes when we have one billionth of a base unit, very small, but pico, or lowercase p, tells us that we have one trillionth of a base unit, very small. Ah, but we can go even smaller than that. Femto, a lowercase f, tells us that we have one quadrillionth of something, of a base unit. And then finally, atto, or lowercase a, describes when we have one quintillionth of a base unit. That's extremely, extremely small. So there you go. This represents our metric system, the ability that we have to designate groups of 10 based on our base units. Now let's take a few moments to talk a little more about temperature. We have three different scales that are most commonly used. We have Fahrenheit that we use here in the United States, Celsius, and then we have Kelvin. I've already described to you how Kelvin is the base unit of the metric system for temperature. So we'll get to that in just a moment. The Fahrenheit scale was developed back in 1724 by a guy named Gabriel Fahrenheit. And in this, he set some certain points on his scale 
For instance, he designated that 32 degrees Fahrenheit would be the freezing point of water. And then 212 degrees Fahrenheit is the boiling point of water. But then along came a scientist from Sweden named Anders Celsius, who came up with the Celsius scale, in which he went from zero to 100, zero being the freezing point of water and 100 degrees being the boiling point of water. Now, of course, it is possible to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit and vice versa. To find Celsius degrees based on Fahrenheit degrees, we would take the Fahrenheit reading and subtract 32 from that. We divide it by 1.8, and that will give us our degrees in Celsius. So the opposite is true for Fahrenheit. If we have our Celsius temperature, then we can multiply that by 1.8 and add 32 to it, and we will have degrees Fahrenheit. For example, if we have 10 degrees Celsius, to find the degrees Fahrenheit, we'd multiply 10 by 1.8 and add 32, and we arrive at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Now what if we try to convert 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit into Celsius? We would take the Fahrenheit reading, subtract 32, and divide by 1.8. And that gives us a Celsius reading of 37 degrees. The third scale is one that we'll use most often in our calculations here in class, and that is the Kelvin scale. The Kelvin scale was developed by a Scottish physicist named William Thompson, who was later known as Lord Kelvin. There you go. You'll remember we talked about temperature as being a measure of the energy inside those particles, the kinetic energy, the motion that's going on in those particles. Well, Lord Kelvin took that idea and extrapolated that there would be a point at which all motion would cease in those particles. He called it absolute zero, or zero Kelvin. Again, zero Kelvin is the concept that all motion stops, that there's no more energy in those particles. Zero Kelvin would correspond to negative 273.15 degrees Celsius or negative 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit. Now here's the crazy thing though. Zero Kelvin is really impossible to reach. And the reason has to do with how much work that goes into removing heat from that substance. The work that goes into removing heat increases substantially as you get closer and closer to absolute zero. And so to reach zero Kelvin, it would require an infinite amount of work. And even if you could get there, there's not truly zero energy because of some things that we learn about in quantum mechanics. At any rate, the Kelvin scale is the best for us in thinking in terms of kinetic energy. And so we use this in the laboratory. So on the Kelvin scale, water freezes at 273.15 Kelvin and boils at 373.15 Kelvin. You'll notice that I'm not saying degrees Kelvin. That's because the Kelvin is the unit. We don't say degrees Kelvin like we do degrees Celsius, degrees Fahrenheit. It's just Kelvin. Now it's very easy to convert from Celsius to Kelvin and from Kelvin to Celsius. It's simply a matter of adding or subtracting 273.15. So to find Kelvin, we take the Celsius reading and we add 273.15 to that. If we want Celsius and we have our Kelvin reading, we simply subtract 273.15. Finally, let's talk a bit about derived units. We've talked about base units, but derived units are derived from those base units. In other words, we put the base units together to get these new types of units. A few examples of derived units. Velocity is one where you have a length, a distance, per unit time. In this case, we could say meters per second, or it could be kilometers or kilometers per second, or, or what have you. Volume is another type of derived unit. If you think about it, volume is simply a length times a length times a length, isn't it? So we could have cubic meters, cubic centimeters, cubic decimeters, or we can also have units of volume that are called liters or milliliters. These are all different types of volumes. Now a cubic meter would be pretty bulky, pretty unwieldy to use as a unit of volume. So it's more often that we use things like the cubic centimeter or the cubic decimeter. Now it may interest you to know that a cubic centimeter has the same exact volume as one milliliter. And a cubic decimeter has the same volume as one liter. 
so that may be helpful to you in future calculations. Density is a third example. And here's an example in which we have a derived unit involved in a derived unit. Now, density is a physical property of matter. It's defined as the amount of mass per unit volume. So to find density, we might find the mass of an object in kilograms or grams or centigrams or what have you. And we would divide that by the volume that that object takes, whether it's cubic meters or cubic centimeters or milliliters or liters. All of these are examples of ways in which we can calculate density. Okay, before we go, I've got a problem for you, and I want you to see if you can solve this. I have a cylinder that contains five milliliters of water. Now, in that cylinder, I place an object, and it's a weirdly shaped object, and when I put that object in the cylinder, the water rises to a level of eight milliliters. Now, the object itself has a mass of 30 grams. What I want you to figure out is, what is the density of that object? That's all the time we have for today. Today we talked about the base units of the International System of Measures. We also talked about the metric system, the prefixes we use to determine how many multiples of that base unit we have. And then we talked about different scales that we use for temperature, with Kelvin being the one that we use the most in the laboratory. And finally, we talked about derived units, things like velocity, volume, or density, in which we take base units and we form a new type of unit. I hope this has been informative for you and helpful. If I can assist you in any way, just please give me an email. Until next time, God bless.